Welcome back. Our next speaker really caught my eye when she started building amazing art pieces around old cathode ray tubes. Uh, but she does work in all kinds of mediums, in wood, in metal, even in human bone. She's going to tell us how she pulls off these amazing projects today. Please join me in welcoming to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Emily Velasco. Hey everyone, how you doing? You excited? You ready to get weird? I don't know. I, are you guys ready? Yeah? Are you really ready? Are we really ready? All right, let's go. Okay, so um, my talk is why you should make ugly, weird, and annoying things, because um, that's what I do. And uh, <laughs> um, I want you guys to do it too. So um, yeah, let's get started here. That's uh, next. OK, so why indeed? Um, when I was putting this talk together, I, I was sitting around my house and trying to think, like, well, I want to encourage you all to make weird, annoying things. But like, I found myself at kind of, I was, I was kind of stuck. I was like, well, why? Like, I hadn't honestly thought about it. Like, I do this, but like, why do I do it? Like, I do it because it's fun. But like, if I'm going to make a case for all of you to do it, like, I need to like, use my words and like, talk and explain things. So, um, you know, for, for the longest time, like as long as I can remember, I have enjoyed weird things. I like weird music, I like weird clothes, I like weird architecture. I just really love weird stuff. And um, like, but why? Like, what is it about it? So I thought about it some more and it was like, well, I don't know that I can tell any of you why you should make weird things, but I'm gonna tell you why I like to make weird things. And maybe you'll find that you agree with some of these things. So, um, yeah, that was one of my recent projects. Um, this was the death clock. Um, and the idea behind that, like, this was honestly a project partially born out of spite. Um, <laughs> I was asking people for ideas. My friend Roger and I, Roger's here in the audience, we were, we were doing something with this vacuum fluorescent display, and we wanted to make something out of it. And I asked people on Twitter, like, what should I do with it? And they all said, make a clock. And I was like, no, there's a million vacuum fluorescent display clocks out there. But they are all like, make a clock. And I was like, fine. I'll make a clock, I'm gonna make a death clock. So what this does is when you touch the little capacitive touch sensor, it kind of reads, reads you and then it tells you when you're gonna die, it gives you a day and a time. <laughs> so, like that sets the stage for like, just this is like the kind of level of weird stuff I work on. Um, so as I said, like I really have a good time making weird stuff. Like it's just, it's not the ordinary and it really kind of like gives me something like to kind of stretch my boundaries with. Um, so you know how like for a lot of people there comes a moment in, in their life when they, when they discover something, they see something that kind of opens their horizons, it kind of opens their mind, they have like a dawning realization about something that like really feels right to them. Um, so for me that moment came when I was 12, there was a movie that came out this, that year that really like, it, there, was, there was something in that movie that really clicked with me and um, I don't know if you guys... You might, you might know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. So um, Toy Story came out in 1995. Uh, I was 12. And um, Sid, our good friend Sid here, um, he, was, he was undoubtedly the villain of the movie, right? Like, like the toys were trying to rescue. It was Woody. I think that he had Woody, right? Um, and like he, he turned those toys into like these mutant monster toys. And like maybe he was a villain, because like I, there's probably some consent issues involved there with those poor toys. Um, but honestly, like the things that he made in that movie were so much more interesting than anything else I had seen in my life. And like much more interesting than anything else in the movie. Like I liked those mutant toys way better than like the good toys, right? That's how the developers built the Pixar too. I, I can imagine, right? <laughs> that was probably their excuse to work some weird things into the movie, right? So, like, there's probably some kindred spirits there. Um, and they're just great. Like, you have a baby head on, like, a mechanical spider, and you have, like, there's, there's the fishing pole with the women's legs, and there's, like, the, the, mon the bodybuilder with the duck head. Like, they're so good. Like, they're a mishmash of parts. They're made of things that, like, don't belong together, but, like, at the same time, they go really well together. And, like, you know, the other toys were afraid of them, right? Like, these were the monsters. They were scared of them, but, like, Kind of the moral of the story is that it turns out that those like scary monster weird toys like are their friends too, right? Like, 
So that's the thing that I really like about making weird things is like you can make something really weird and really ugly and really kind of like off-putting, but like making something with a lot of love and so that like someone looks at it at first and they like kind of cringe and they go, why did you make that for? But the more time they spend with it, like the more they start to see the charms. And that, that's one thing that I really like about making these weird things is that like you can make something that like on one hand like violates all kinds of aesthetic sensibilities, but on the other hand, it's just so freaking cool. So um, let's go through some definitions real quick. I know that's boring, but like if I'm gonna be throwing around these terms like ugly, weird, and annoying, like we should talk about definitions. Um, so yeah, de definitions. So ugly, um, yeah, displeasing to the eye, not aesthetically pleasing, displeasing to the ear, or some other sense. Like, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, weird, having an unusually strange character or behavior, deviating from the normal, bizarre. Let's, let's remember that point, like deviating from the normal. And then annoying, um, causing annoyance. <laughs> okay, so let's, annoyance, that which annoys. Like, okay, <laughs> all, right. all right, let's forget that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the one thing that all those three terms have in common is that they're value judgments, right? Like, these are opinions. Like, someone says something is ugly, something, someone says something is annoying, something says, someone says something is weird. Like, that's their judgment of that thing. But they're just opinions. Their aesthetic preferences, like, what one person thinks is ugly might be really beautiful to someone else. And, like, if you have different experiences from someone, what you think is normal might be different than what someone else thinks is normal, right? And even like something that's annoying, it might be annoying to you at one time of the day and like great at another time of the day. Like if it's a hot day and it's the afternoon, you heard the ice cream man, like, yeah, like it's ice cream man, right? But if it's like two in the morning and the ice cream man's parked out of your house, like that's the worst. So <laughs> yeah, so it's all contextual. It's like, what is the context in which you're, observing these things, experiencing these things. And that's another thing I really like about making things that are weird. There's like, there's a context to all of it and, and, and it changes for people all the time. It's fluid and it's dynamic. And there's a really great quote by this composer named John Cage that touches on this point. And so he says, the first question I ask myself when something doesn't seem to be beautiful is why I do, why I do not think it's beautiful. And very shortly you discover that there is no reason. And that's, that's really true. Like we, a lot of times, like it's the old saying, like don't judge a book by its cover. And like we immediately make a value judgment about things when we see them. But like if we take time to experience them and like observe them and interact with them, like our experience can change and like the way we value them can change. And you know, that, that, that really, that's another point that really like gets to the heart of what I like about making weird, ugly and annoying things is that like we can, we can change that for people. And what he's saying is like, you know, you know, think critically about what you're looking at and like experience it for what it is. Don't just like rely on your first judgments. And because you know, you might be missing out on something that you could otherwise be enjoying. You know, if you just say like, oh, well that thing is awful. And then you just kind of walk away, like you might be missing out on something. So like what I want to do with making weird things is like letting people experience these things and, and, and reassess what, it, what weird is to them, reassess what is nor, abnormal to them, reassess like what is aesthetically pleasing to them. So, you know, sometimes when I've made something, well, not sometimes, like always when I've made something and I show them to someone, like they always like, they, 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 there's a reaction. Like usually it's like, well, well, why? Why did you make that? What is that supposed to do? Um, the, it's off-putting. Um, and so one of these projects here, this is my circuit noise box. Um, after I made this, I took it over to my parents' house when I went for a visit um, because I have a gratuitous need for affirming approval. And so, <laughs> so I took it over there to show my parents because I'm not uh, 36 years old and like my own person, right? Um, <laughs> So I took it over and I turned it on for them and um, my dad rolled his eyes and he groaned and it's like, oh God, what is M doing now? Like, what is that awful thing? Um, but I handed it to him and um, I told him, try this thing out. And so he, he did and um, he took it and he started pressing some of the buttons. And he started twisting some of the knobs and then he started pressing the body contact points. 
and like the noises he were making were just terrible to everyone else, right? He had hated this box. He had hated the box until I gave it to him to try and like it became a thing for him to control and a th thing for him to play with. And you know what? Like five minutes later, he was still playing with that box. And he was annoying the hell out of everyone else in the family. <laughs> but you know what? He was sitting there on his recliner and he was laughing. He was like just totally into this box. And just five minutes before, he had just thought it was the worst thing he had ever seen. And he was totally into it. And um, that's, that's what I mean when I like talk about context is that like if you can change the context for people, then you can change their experience. The thing that like was so annoying had become fun for him. Um, and I, I make weird things because I want other people to enjoy weird things as much as I do. I want to share that with people. Like, I don't know what it, what it is about like the way I formed as a child that said like, I'm gonna like weird things, but like I get such joy out of weird things and I really want other people to be able to experience that with me too. And I think that's maybe becoming a little bit harder these days because we live in a world that is like, so much is polished by like, by design committees and polished by focus groups and by marketing teams and strategies. And like the things that exist in the world around us, like all of our products, they're polished and polished and polished. Like rough edges get smoothed down, like weird things get sanded off. Like everything is made to be inoffensive to the senses before it leaves the drawing board, right? Well, most of the time, right? <laughs> like don't look it in the eye, don't look it in the eye. <laughs> So, um, who here remembers Calvin and Hobbes? Can I get a show of hands? Okay, so I, I had a joke about being an old millennial, but I'm not, I guess I'm not that old. So, um, yeah, there was this, this strip. Um, that, it was a whole series, right? And, and it was like a, like a side plot. And Calvin and Hobbes go digging for fossils. And they just go out to the woods and they dig. And all that they ended up finding is a bunch of like rusty cans and like old cups and like a, a Coke bottle and some old silverware. But like Calvin is convinced that like they're gonna go out there and find fossils. And so like to him, those are fossils. They're not trash, they're fossils. And he takes them back to his house and he's convinced they're a dinosaur. So he assembles them into this dinosaur. And like he's given them a new narrative. And like you see here, like Hobbes draws it for him and it's, it's a weird like kissing dinosaur. But like that, that is the essence of like what is great about making weird things is that you can take things that don't belong together and put them together and you give them a new context and give them a new narrative and like that's not trash anymore right like that was just trash that was littering the forest and now to him it's a dinosaur skeleton like he has transformed those things into something else and i love that because like that's how i work like the things that i make i i make them out of stuff i find you know i have i have like these bird skulls here, like these I found on a beach in Northern California with, with the birds still attached. Um, they were not alive at the time, okay? So, um, but like I can take like parts of animals that like have deceased. I can take old cigar boxes. I can take a funnel. I can take another like wooden box. Hiding inside of here is like some cheap children's toy I found at the thrift store. Um, this is another cigar box. This is a knob I found at a, at a scrap yard. There's a piece of metal here that I found on the side of the road. Like, I can take all these things that I just find out in the world and like transform them into something new. And like, I give them new life and they're not ending up in the landfill. They're, and, and not only are they not ending up in the landfill, they're like taking on new meaning. And I think that's really cool because, you know, a lot of times when you work on a project, you can start with raw materials. You can go to the store, you can buy wood, you can buy like angle iron, you can buy glass and you can make your project exactly the way you wanted it to be. You can have a vision in your head and you can create that exact thing, which is a good feeling, like don't get me wrong. But when you work with materials that you find, you have to let the materials partially direct your creative process. Like they join you, they're part of like this design committee. And so like you might have an idea about what you want your project to be, but then you take ugly weird and things that you found out in the woods or on the side of the street, like literally, these, joyce, these buttons, these arcade buttons, someone threw an arcade machine out of their truck next to my house and it exploded on the road. And it got run over by cars. And I took as many parts off of it as I could. But when you do that, like you're allowing your project to go places you didn't expect maybe. 
And honestly, like most of my projects, like I have an idea, but then I start working with my materials, and then they end up going someplace that I didn't expect. And usually, they end up weirder than I thought they were gonna be. And that's really refreshing because it's kind of a surprise. It makes you work your creative muscles a little bit more to work with the materials you have. And then you end up with something that not even you're expecting to see. And that is such a fun feeling. So in conclusion, like there's nothing wrong with normal, but there's nothing inherently right about normal either. And when we would decide that one thing is normal and another thing is abnormal, we're setting limits on ourselves. We're saying like, these are the things that are okay and these are the things that are not. And I don't think we should be limiting ourselves. You know, like you don't wanna, like why, why put all those things like in the closet and say like, those are not okay. Like, no, like there's a lot of stuff in the world that like is overlooked and is forgotten and like that no one wants. But those things are wonderful for making your projects and they will bring such like a different flavor to your projects. We live in this world with this pressure that everyone experiences to be normal. Like that's like if you've been through junior high, like you've felt that. Like, like don't do anything weird because like you're gonna be the outcast. You know, wear normal clothes, like get a normal job, like go to normal places and have normal hobbies. But that's very limiting. And I don't want you to be limited because you, you're all creative people. You're here, you're creative. And I want you to be able to like stretch your creative abilities like as far as they can go. So like, Next time you think about something and you think like, well, that's weird. Like you see something and think that's weird. Like ask yourself, why is it weird? And ask yourself if it's really weird, like what makes it feel weird to you? And maybe you'll find that that weird thing isn't so weird after all. And maybe you'll find that you'll find some weirdness in your own life to enjoy. So thank you.